Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome to the moon. I am your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I am joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Uh, Jerry is back this week, and uh, today we are interviewing the fantastic uh, Joseph Tetek uh, of Satoshi Labs and Trezor, uh, as well as being a contributor for uh, Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, Joseph, we are uh, blessed to have you here today. Uh, first off, how are you doing on this uh, sunny, sunny day? Hi. Uh, yeah, very good. It's actually sunny in here in Prague as well. It's uh, kind of funny because you are probably on the other side of the planet, <laughs> but it's still sunny there. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, in the UK, it's been pouring with rain, but it's just brightly come through. So that's always uh, <laughs> always good. <laughs> but um, yeah, I won't waste uh, the listeners' time with uh, weather chit chat as as British as it would be. Um, so yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess. I guess um, Somewhere I always like to really begin uh, when when we're talking to people uh, for the first time uh, is to kind of uh, understand, uh, you know, your earlier days in life uh, and how that kind of shapes you now and and, and your like views on on Bitcoin and, and what you're doing in, in life. Um, so when I um, when I looked back uh, just at some stuff about yourself online, uh, I saw that uh, I think it was uh, 2011, I believe it was. Uh, you founded the Czech and Slovak Ludwig von, Ludwig von Mises uh, Institute uh, back then. So uh, very in Aust- very Austrian economics, uh, which is which is cool. Um, and I guess like I just wanted to understand kind of what you were about and what you were doing, like even professionally in life uh, before you properly discovered Bitcoin. Uh, really, it would be interesting to to hear that. Sure. Uh, so like you said, I founded Czech and Slovak Mises Institute uh, that was just right after the school in 2011. And my background is in economics and I enjoyed uh, like studying economics and political philosophy, Austrian School of Economics and Libertarianism. And I wanted to have some connection to that after school as well, because uh, I was quite lucky to study uh, with some contemporary Austrian economists. Uh, so that was pretty good. Uh, and I didn't want to lose this connection. Uh, and uh, we had all kinds of seminars, published books and such. And uh, like uh, the first encounter with Bitcoin for me was in, let's say, 2012. We had a first lecture on Bitcoin. Uh, I didn't pay as much attention back then because we were sort of uh, gold bucks, uh, gold and silver bucks, and we kind of believed in what Peter Schiff believes up to up to this day, that uh, it's sort of coming back. Uh, uh, from a like professional perspective, it's not very interesting because I used to work as uh, as an analyst for various corporations. And I'm very happy to escape that life uh, by 2017 when I uh, got involved in Bitcoin uh, professionally as well. Uh, Yeah, and uh, so uh, I also wrote two books in Czech language uh, that are focused on political philosophy. Uh, The first is called uh, Enemies of State uh, and Friends of Liberty where I cover like uh, bios of Lysander Spooner, Mario Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek and such. And the second book is uh, on Bitcoin, Bitcoin, the separation of money and state. So this is sort of my background. I approach Bitcoin uh, through economics and political philosophy. And uh, like what's kind of interesting for me or yeah, it is interesting to this day is uh, how people approach Bitcoin based on their background or their uh, like interests. Uh, because when we first started to pay attention to Bitcoin, when we ceased to be gold bucks in Mises Institute, uh, we found out the early adopters are basically all hackers, coders, programmers, like tech guys. And we started to join Bitcoin meetups. And it was like 70% these tech guys and 30% Austro libertarians. And we sort of started to teach each other uh, what our site is about. Like we economists uh, learned about cryptography and 
privacy, computer security. And we taught the techies about uh, Australian economics and why Bitcoin actually matters, uh, not just from a technical perspective, not just as a cool, you know, uh, torrent-like kind of stuff, but as a civilizational, basically, advancement. Why the uh, global monetary system matters so much. Uh, and this was like 2015 to 2017 when Bitcoin was still kind of off the radar for the mainstream. And I like to uh, remember this time because it was uh, one of like the best years for me intellectually uh, to re really learn something new. But you learn something new about Bitcoin every day. So it's sort of there to this day. That's pretty cool. And it's, it's awesome that you got a chance to learn about Austrian economics whilst you're studying and stuff as well, because I mean, I remember from just like the economics uh, that we did in university, it was like nothing like Austrian economics. It's like the complete yeah. opposite to be frank. Um, so it's really cool that, that there was that uh, opportunity and that you took that and, and ran with it and started the Institute and, and, and kind of had these lectures. And you, and you said like um, 2012, uh, you know, you, you had this lecture on Bitcoin, so you were kind of aware of it and, and, and roughly what it was about. Um, but like, was there ever like a, a clicking moment for you where it's like, oh my word, like this goes together with what I've been thinking and believing for so many years. Yeah, um, it was sort of gradual, but I believe uh, the tipping point for me was a lecture from Andreas Antonopoulos in 2016, um, because in Prague we have a Paralelni Polis and they host a Hackers Congress uh, and it's been going since, I believe, 2014 or 15. And in 2016, Andreas came and he had like the best lecture on any topic I have heard in my life. And I really started to study Bitcoin after that because I saw somebody who truly believes this is going to change the world. Uh, it was not like all about price. Uh, it was completely opposite. So I believe this was the moment about five years ago in October 2016 under Andreas' talk. Yeah. That's, cra that's crazy because like for me, uh, Andreas is the guy that kind of got me to properly get because i i went to crypto crypto first you know just all sorts of like old coins and trying to you know make money and so and then it was kind of like you know um Andreas Antonopoulos that made me realize that's what you know like that actually goes along with what i've been believing for the last decade or any sort of thing uh, yeah so yeah i i sort of uh mingled with altcoins as well it uh i i it's maybe uh kind of like the usual story i became a bitcoiner then in 2017, I thought there was this huge like uh, fun ecosystem of various coins. Uh, I burned uh, myself quite a bit. And since like 2019, I came back to being a Bitcoiner. And uh, I now am much more certain why I'm actually a Bitcoiner and nothing else. Uh, Joseph, I wanted to ask you, why do you think that uh, the Czech Republic has such like strong uh, crypto anarchist roots? You mentioned Parallelny uh, Polis, but um, it seems like there's like a lot of interest in Austrian economics and also crypto anarchy in the Czech Republic. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, uh, like I said, uh, I was able to study Austrian economics in school in uh, University of Economics. There used to be a faculty, like economics faculty that was basically full of uh, Austro libertarians. And uh, I'm not sure if there's actually any like real reason for that. Maybe it's because uh, in the 90s, when we were coming out of like the communism period, uh, the government was very right wing and uh, People like Milton Friedman and such were attracted to basically travel to Czech Republic, give some lectures here. And Liberani Institute, uh, which was a sort of precursor to Mises Institute, was founded in 1989. So very, very early on. And uh, we had Ron Paul in Czech Republic, I believe that was in 2006. We had Friedman, we had David Friedman several times as well. Uh, and yeah, it sort of made sense to us uh, in the 90s, uh, maybe less so right now because uh, the 
experience with communism isn't as fresh anymore, but it's been living on in here. We have all the major works from Rothbard, Mises, Hayek translated to Czech. Uh, we keep on publishing new editions of that. Uh, Brains, uh, also an like important Bitcoin company that are managing slush pool, they actually have a Brains publishing part of their company and they are publishing uh, uh, books on Bitcoin in Czech. Uh, there, there is going to be a uh, uh, Bitcoin standard published soon uh, in like one month. And we also published, uh, uh, um, how is it called, from Jan Pritzker, uh, Inventing Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin Money, like the children's book. So yeah, it's been very, very live and uh, people have been very perceptive to the idea of uh, like non-governmental organization that's sort of emerging like Bitcoin and like all kinds of crypto anarchic stuff as well. And Bitcoin had a very good uh, grassroots uh, here uh, because of uh, Slash and Stick, founders of Satoshi Labs and Trezor, uh, because they were uh, like the very earliest adopters. Uh, Slash came up with Slash Pool, with the pool, pool mining as well. Uh, General Bytes were one of the earliest uh, Bitcoin ATMs. That's also a Czech company. Yeah, Paranipolis Bitcoin Hackerspace has been founded in, I believe, 2014. So, uh, yeah, Prague is very cool for Bitcoin development. That's, that's right. And for uh, libertarian kind of leaning uh, philosophy as well. But you wouldn't uh, actually see it in our politics. Our like real politics is uh, as bad as everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah, I can confirm Prague's a beautiful place, though. Um, having visited myself, uh, awesome place. Um, I guess, like, because uh, you mentioned uh, the publishing of, of books um, and also, you know, you, you write for Bitcoin Magazine. You're obviously a fan of, uh, of writing and publishing and the written word, that'd be fair to say. Um, what, uh, I guess, a question that's a, a bit, bit random, but uh, what would you say is your, is your favorite book, I guess, on Bitcoin? I have interest just for, you know, myself and listeners to understand. Sure. Um... I believe it's uh, Nick Batia's Layered Money. Uh, if we are talking Bitcoin as such, uh, then I believe uh, Layered Money uh, really makes some things click for a lot of people, uh, especially in terms of how money evolves and why it makes sense for uh, Bitcoin to evolve in layers and not to have like competing standards uh, like with alt altcoins. Um, so that's a very approachable book and uh, I actually learned something new, which is not the case always with uh, Bitcoin focused books. Um, other than that, I believe uh, Friedrich Hayek uh, has a lot of good stuff. Sometimes he's a little harder to approach. Uh, not to uh, name a book, but an article, The Use of Knowledge in Society by Friedrich Hayek, I believe is one of the most important uh, articles in economics, The Use of Knowledge in Society, heavily recommended. And um, for like a general economics way of thinking, I believe Milton, Fried Milton, Milton Friedman's um, Freedom to Choose uh, this is a very solid book for everybody to read and just to get into the mindset of why economics matters so much. And then from that, you can uh, follow up with like monetary economics. And there you have like a lot of choices. Oh, thanks. It's uh, yeah, three books I've never read. So that's uh, good. It adds to my reading list. Uh, I'm not a huge reader when I do. I want to make sure it's, you know, books that I think will make a, a big change. Um, I always find it's funny because every time I read a Bitcoin or a crypto book, I always think, oh, I'm not going to learn much. And then I always end up learning quite a lot. <laughs> I've always yeah. got that cocky view in my head. Like, but actually, yeah, so. yeah. Another good book is uh, Jeff Boots, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, uh, which sort of explains why deflation isn't as harmful as it's presented all, all, all the time and why like price deflation is actually inevitable in uh, 
like a progressive society, but in a society where uh, technology progresses and basically drives costs down. And Jeff Booth is very, uh, very much able to explain that in layman's terms, and he's very good on podcasts as well. So Nick Batia and Jeff Booth are like two of my favorite uh, authors uh, currently uh, in the past year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt it. Thanks. And uh, we, I mean, I guess um, there's a question I've got, which uh, kind of pushes us to another topic. Um, and then I'll, I'll hand you to Jerry and Ricardo to ask further. But um, yeah, one, one thing I wanted to understand, I guess, is obviously your um, uh, you're currently uh, working with uh, Satoshi Labs, Trezor, um what was uh i guess i guess like to go to go back in time i guess what was the story behind that like how did that occur um and, and additionally as like a sort of second follow-up question what's the uh philosophy like there working within social labs and, and trace or like how, how how is that like from a you know a day by day perspective or you know like a, a values perspective what's it like working at, at the, the company so the story uh, behind me working for Trezor, um, I've been working for Trezor since uh, this spring, uh, so for about half a year now. Uh, but I knew uh, Slash and Stake for several years. And uh, I've been doing a lot of, uh, let's say, education, Bitcoin-focused education in Czech language uh, for several years now. And uh, Slash approached me uh, in the past winter uh about like with uh, the opportunity to represent Trezor and do what i do like a bitcoin focused education uh for basically the global audience not just in czech but in english as well and to uh represent Trezor and satoshi apps uh, along with that uh that was of course very uh like interesting for me because uh, i've been following satoshi apps since uh, the beginning and i uh, as the years went by uh i knew i had to get get involved in some in some bitcoin focused company so it was a uh, no brainer for me to join satoshi apps uh and uh yeah, uh, so the idea is to explain why bitcoin matters so much why it's not just some kind of fad that's going to pump and dump later, why what happens with Bitcoin happens, be it uh, early developments like Silk Road, Mungox, uh, be it uh, using Bitcoin as a store of value instead of means of exchange, uh, adopting Bitcoin as a legal tender in El Salvador and such. So explaining why all of this happens and why we need to why we need to take Bitcoin seriously, along with its like privacy and security consequences. Like you should always hold your own keys. You should use open source hardware wallets and such. And uh, this way, I can uh, continue with the philosophy in uh, Satoshi Labs. It's very much focused on. Uh, being open source, being transparent in everything we do. Uh, our roadmap is transparent, our designs, our hardware, our firmware, our software, like wallet software, Trezor Suite, everything is open source, everything is available on GitHub. And uh, this is like the core uh, mission of uh, the founders of Slash and Stick to not uh, do any compromises in terms of transparency, not cutting any corners, not actually uh, receiving any uh, external funding. Satoshi Labs is still privately owned since the beginning. Uh, and um, it could lead to some kind of compromise uh, in terms of providing our users with the best uh, security there is if we accepted some external funding. Uh, and yeah, it's a Bitcoin first, Bitcoin focused company. Uh, with a very interesting uh, like vision for the future. There's a lot of stuff we can still bring our clients, our customers uh, in terms of uh, privacy, like uh, coin join, coin control, full node support, uh, Tor Connect. Uh, everything is on our roadmap uh, being implemented in the coming months. So uh yeah it's uh it's been a ride and it's uh something else completely to witness it firsthand how these products uh, emerge uh how uh, the user how 
basically users what kind of trouble they uh, uh, they uh, they meet over the years uh, and yeah and, and such. So yeah. I wanted to ask you. I know Slushpool was started in the Czech Republic. Is mining still viable? there or are electricity costs too expensive now to to permit mining mining is uh, viable if you do it uh, as a kind of dca kind of stuff like if you don't really care about uh, the operating profit right now so this way you can mine basically everywhere in the world it's a non-kyc dca kind of thing uh but if you are mining for uh operating profit uh there are are pro probably better countries to mine in than Czech Republic. But there are exceptions. Um, if you have like solar panels, if you can find a way to uh, use uh, a cheap natural gas, which is not the case right now because natural gas has been skyrocketing. Um, there are edge cases where you can still make mining profitable even in Czech Republic, uh, but I'm not uh, really focused on mining myself. And uh, maybe to clarify, Slush Pool was founded by Slush, by uh, the founder of Soto Shops as well, but it's been operated and owned uh, by Brains System, which is a separate company now. Um, so I have a question. Um, you, I remember you did mention that um, you were into Bitcoin before you got distracted and, you know, deviated into other you know altcoins then went back to bitcoin and you also mentioned that you know satoshi labs trezor is a bitcoin first company what i wanted to ask is you know i i see that you know bitcoin first and bitcoin centric are two different things now when you consider that um uh, trezor does also support you know altcoins for many other bitcoin maximalists they would you know consider them as shit coins you know how would you you know um how would you you know reconcile these two you know parallels like you know, these are two opposite sides if depending on which perspective you're coming from how if if i can understand being a bitcoin first you know company but not bitcoin centric so what is satoshi labs you know how does satoshi Labs view bitcoin and all coins how do they merge these you know these two worlds into these two different ideologies into one and as a company how does that how do you how do you operate basically in that regard so uh, the features that are on our roadmap uh, are all revolving around bitcoin like coin join child pays for parent full node support coin control uh, and such and uh, we also release uh, Trezor only firmware, uh, Bitcoin only firmware. So if uh, people like me, for example, are interested in keeping only Bitcoin in their Trezor, uh, that's not a problem. And you don't have to uh, encounter any uh, altcoins uh, on your experience with the Trezor suite. And uh, when it comes to like uh, adding some altcoin features or altcoin support, this is done by the respective communities of these altcoins. We uh, basically uh, say what the requirements are for their pull requests on GitHub. They have to do it themselves. Then we just check if everything is all right, if this will be safe for the users, and then we merge it uh, into you know Trezor Suite. But uh, we like some uh, like. Bitcoin only manufacturers say we can lose some kind of focus on Bitcoin if we have altcoin support as well. But this is not the case because the work is being done by the altcoin communities. If they are interested in adding some features or having an altcoin support, we provide them with uh, the environment because everything is open source. Uh, we uh, give them guidelines on what they should uh, fulfill in order to make it safe and they have to do their own work and actually uh, with some altcoins what uh, happened at least once was uh, they kind of broke the, the compatibility and we had to basically uh, see supporting uh, and I just forgot what kind of altcoin it was, but this has happened. If the community doesn't uh, provide this kind of support uh, for the users, then they don't they won't have uh, the support in the Trezor Suite. I feel like also uh, 
as someone who's very much like pro people being able to decide what they want to do kind of thing. Uh, and also someone, I guess you're wa- I'm wary that you've got uh, a big competitor in ledger. Um, it, I feel like if you, if you, if you went to being Bitcoin only rather than Bitcoin first, you're going to run that issue that, um, that suddenly there's a lot of people who, uh, not even going to consider your product, right? I guess is is another concern. Like, because um, there's another thing as well to consider. Like, um, as you said before, you you got into Bitcoin first, then you spent an, a period of time being interested in, alt- in altcoins. And what if that was the period that you decided to buy your hardware wallet? And if if Trezor didn't accept any altcoins whatsoever, you would never have picked one up. Uh, there was a Trezor, you would have gone for Ledger, for example. And then by the time you're back to being Bitcoin only, you're like, oh, well, I've got my Ledger, it works fine. And then now you're not going to be a Trezor customer. So I suppose there is that element of needing to compete maybe as well that, that means you can't be bitcoin only um I, would that be fair to say or uh that that, that surely must have i would have thought gone through the mind of yourselves yeah that. well um that was uh, part of the case in 2017 when uh people were shitcoining a lot and uh you had a trouble with like segway bitcoin cash hard forking and such and uh like Bitcoin maximalism was very, uh, like was quite kind of niche back then. Uh, I respect highly everyone who saw it back then even, uh, but it wasn't as widespread as it is today. So uh, yeah, that was, that's a part of the story that in order to survive basically 2017, you sort of had to support altcoins, but uh, uh like to comment on today, uh, we are not necessarily in the position to educate people about like their investment choices, let's say. And there are a lot of people that maybe uh, are lured in through NFTs or DeFi or some kind of new hype. And gradually they will see that Bitcoin is the one thing that stays over the years and that uh, doesn't uh, bankrupt them basically so uh, uh, it's not set in stone like somebody can be 100 percent ethereum or solana or cardano or something and once they get burned as the next bear market comes they will probably switch to bitcoin and we want to be there for them and uh, even if they choose like 100 percent ethereum and some uh, NFTs and such, uh, these people still deserve to have uh, the best in class security, which uh, I don't believe the hardware wallets that are not fully open source provide. As far as yeah. like hedge funds and, and investment firms and stuff like that go, are they using Trezor or do you see them using more like uh, custodial services? Well, uh, I definitely know, for example, Unchained Capital is using Trezor as part of their uh, multi sig uh, scheme. Uh, and um, I probably cannot name any other names. Unchained Capital is well known in, in this regard. Uh, but yeah, like hedge funds usually use either professional custodial services like BitGo, uh, or they use like assisted multisig uh, scheme like Unchained Capital provides. Or if they choose to uh, hold their own, their own, they are going for uh, Trezor or some kind of other hardware wallet. Uh, but yeah, I, these people are well educated in how to safe keep it, and Trezor is uh, part of the solution. Now in the, in the in Bitcoin, what is the most interesting thing, thing for you now in the, in the Bitcoin space? What do you find most intriguing right now? And what are you looking forward to? Yeah, it's probably uh, Lightning Network. I will think about Lightning Network, uh, how uh, the capacity exploded this year. It's totally amazing how uh, the experience with Lightning Network improved. Uh, So yeah, I will think about that. Uh, I'm very curious how the situation in El Salvador plays out over the coming months. Uh, very curious if some other countries follow in their steps. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a, as to, to adopt Bitcoin as a legal tender, but to just uh, make the environment uh, less uh, less hostile, let's say. And yeah, also kind of um, curious about Taproot. Uh, it should be activated, I believe, in November. Uh, 
uh, and curious what kind of new use cases we will see there with Taproot. You mentioned El Salvador, and I, I read your um, recent article on the state and Bitcoin bans. Uh, and one of the key examples I took from that was, um, I guess like you're writing a style where I, I assumed you were kind of concerned, I suppose, about the United States trying to push Bitcoin innovation to fit within this kind of this uh, this box that they've they've drawn for for crypto and for Bitcoin. Um, and, and and obviously we can see like lightning on on Twitter and, and and as you said El Salvador and the way that lightning and Bitcoin has taken off there. Um, what would you say is like your your biggest fear, I suppose, for the coming years? Like, do you have any concerns, for example, about like um like the centralized uses for Bitcoin and Lightning? Like, I've seen some people concerned, for example, about Twitter and, and Lightning and how it's kind of not this ideal use yeah. of Bitcoin, or, or I guess if you just got more excitement for the future, kind of thing. Well, my biggest uh, concern is that people will buy and keep their Bitcoin on an exchange, like on some major one, like Kraken or Coinbase. And uh, you never know how this is going to play out. The government could start uh, taxing such uh, such uh, uh, balances, or it could uh, straight away confiscate it, like happened with gold in 1933. Uh, it doesn't have to happen in the US, but it can happen in other countries. I'm not very happy about Chivo Wallet being custodial and being totally centralized. Uh, good questions are being asked about Chivo in terms of who owns the keys, if there are actually any, like, if there are actually sufficient reserves of Bitcoin backing up the balances. So, yeah, uh, custodial Bitcoin, this is the biggest concern for people to just. Uh, be happy with uh, sort of buying into Bitcoin, maybe doing some DCA, uh, understanding why Bitcoin matters, but not doing the most important step, taking possession of their coins and keep, keeping them in Trezor. Uh, because you don't own any Bitcoin if you hold it on some centralized exchange. That, that's true. I mean, I, I guess I, I uh, like my thoughts on custody of bitcoin is such a like a up and down because <laughs> i kind of i kind of like i i get it right like i get from perspective that if i'm talking to someone who has no idea about about bitcoin at all um i can understand how to them like you know say you talk to someone who's always kept their money in their bank they don't necessarily even understand how the pound or the dollar or the euro even works uh and they've just kind of spent they earn their salary and that's it kind of thing they've never had to worry about it really um for someone like that they may not trust themselves as as, as crazy as it is or as ironic as it is to look after their own money um uh, or they may just be elderly and, and be concerned about their own memory for example um so i guess it's like custody to me feels like something that is inevitably required at, like, at least for now to to bring people in teach them and then they make that next step once they feel like they understand it enough uh, I don't know if you agree or disagree. Like, would you? How would you? How would you sort of feel like we could remove the need for a custodial services, or or do you think it's even worth removing the need for custodial services? Because I guess you mentioned custody as like a concern of yours, which is fair. I just wonder how far that goes. Like, do you do you really worry about it as a hundred percent being around thing, or or what's your kind of balance? I guess. Yeah, I believe it uh, boils down to uh, usability to UX. And uh, like three pillars in what we do at Satoshi Labs is basically security, privacy, and usability. Uh, like if you are super secure uh, and super private, but it's uh, hard for users to uh, work with your tools, they are not going to do it and they are going to hold their Bitcoin on Coinbase or something. So uh, this is a big part big uh, like part of uh, why we uh, developed Trezor Suite as a standalone, standalone application for interacting with Trezor. Uh, because like a big part of it is uh, the onboarding process where we explain what you should do, uh, what kind of prompts uh, you should follow on your device, never to uh, type your seed into some web page and such, uh, how to securely store your seed. And I guess it could be sort of intimidating for total newcomers, but uh, 
I believe we are doing a very good job now in explaining why it actually matters to take the time to uh, understand, write down your seed, secure it uh, safely, uh, come up with some passphrase and such. And uh, it's like when people started to learn how to work with internet, how to send their first emails, how to work with internet banking, it was always intimidating uh, at first, but as these new technologies became part of society, uh, people adjusted and it became part of everyday life. And I believe uh, this is going to happen with Bitcoin self-custody as well. Uh, the UX is the biggest concern here. And yeah, uh, like stuff like Coinbase uh, is probably easier for people to use uh up till recently but i believe with uh, tools like uh, treasure suite it's uh, sort of on par and it's becoming uh, uh, an okay experience for people to get on board it with their own trezor and uh, just understand what they are doing i think that's like a key thing as well um just getting people into bitcoin in general but as you say as well pay, take, making them take the next step to to taking care of and custody and taking their own keys holding their own keys sorry um yeah it's very much like uh if, if you if you make it like something they are already aware of or used to right like if you make your app somewhat similar to amazon or or banking apps that they already use then it makes it so much less scary for someone like i remember when i first got into crypto and uh, I first got into my buddy was like, hey, buy some XRP. So I was like, all right, yeah, sure. So, uh, <laughs> so he's walking me through this. And I remember at the time, like buying some, and I didn't know what I was doing. No, I knew, no idea what really, you know, what, what crypto really was. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got a Coinbase account, a Binance account. I'm buying something on Coinbase. And I'm sending some, and I, I bought Bitcoin, turned to Litecoin for some reason. And I think it was quicker. And you send that to Binance. And then I'm, you know, the fear that strikes you when you've sent some money from one to the other. And you have no idea if you've done it right or not. So there's always those things that are terrifying. And Binance to me at the time was like, what the hell is going on? There's these charts everywhere. And I don't know what's, where to start. <laughs> so um, I can totally get like why people need that simple uh, experience especially to push them into to taking care of their own funds one thing maybe to mention is uh, we don't want to make it too simple for people because people are always going to choose like most people are going to choose uh, uh, the path of least resistance and if they are for example able to skip uh, like uh, writing down their seed uh, they are going to do it in majority so uh, it's important, like a big part of onboarding and making it easier for people is education. And we just have to explain uh, why they do what they do and why it is so important and why it's not advisable to cut corners there through some custody that promises to take care for you. Because this is not what Bitcoin is about. Bitcoin is about financial sovereignty. And... Uh, if you don't want that, you simply are not ready for Bitcoin, I would say. But I believe uh, it's not such a big uh, leap for many people. It's not such a big mental leap from using uh, mobile apps, from using uh, various social networks and such to using uh, a Bitcoin wallet where they control their own keys. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's... It's a small step, but you have to make it. In light of self-custody, what is your opinion on um, custodial lightning wallets like Wallet of Satoshi or Blue Wallet? I believe this is okay because you are not dealing with huge amounts in there. Uh, you are not going to have like $10,000 on a custodial lightning wallet. Uh, you are not going to have $10,000 on any lightning wallet probably. So if you have like a... 10 or 50 dollars on some on some wallet it's not such a big deal if you lose it especially not like for us westerners it might might be a big deal for uh, someone in el salvador and this is why i am sort of concerned by chivo uh, being a custodial wallet and i believe uh, uh, people should uh, or people should like maybe we should uh, make a good job in explaining the difference between open source self-custodial wallets and like uh, governmental 
closed source non custodial wallet yeah uh, yeah not a big deal uh, as not su such a big deal as uh, keeping your life savings on an exchange yeah i would say but still it's better to use something proper like uh, running your own lightning node and connecting zap with that i think most people would agree with that i i, I find things like blue wallet was super easy to to onboard people yeah. into lightning so I just think yeah it's like, oh, no disagreement it. yeah uh, definitely easy. Uh, well, a bit of a random question, but um, it just popped into my mind actually because I've seen it on Twitter loads recently. Uh, are you a? Uh, uh, well, I think it's, I can't remember what it's called now. But are you a? Uh, when it comes to denominations and, and things like that, are you a Bip Sky or a Sat Sky or are you a uh, zero point zero zero five whatever guy? Like, which yeah, you go for? I, I used to be. Uh, I used to be for Bitcoin and uh, just going with uh, uh, you know decimal points. But uh, like after Bitcoin going over ten thousand uh, dollars, this is becoming quite unworkable. So I'm a sets guy, yeah. And uh, I love that Lightning Network uh, works in default with Satoshi's. I know, for example, Vlad Costa is a big bits guy, and uh, I'm a big fan of Vlad. But I believe this is a wrong hill to die on. We are going for sets. I, I like this argument because, um, yeah, as you said, I saw Vlad actually talking about it. And I saw someone else talk about it the other day as well. I think maybe, I think John Carvalho was talking about, uh, I can't remember which way he stands, to be honest. But, um, and I saw Vlad passionately on the, the bits side. I think, I think it's funny because th there's importance to it, right? Obviously, you know, you want to get it, the, 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 the unit of account or whatever correct so that people who are new to it are not as intimidated and it's clearer because I find like I go into a wallet and sometimes it's like MBTC or it's SAT or it's this and I'm like what the hell and like it's auto set and I have to find and sometimes it just winds me up um, so I get it but it also is one of those things that there's not really too much of a you can't it's not like the the block size wars there's not like an ultra practical reason behind like a preference I think a lot of the time it's just what we know slash what we feel is sensible maybe yeah yeah it's not a consensus kind of thing it's uh, just front-end ux and uh, sure if somebody wants to have bits in their wallet they can choose to do so they can choose to switch uh, we are going to have uh, satoshi denominations in trezor suite uh, in the future right now it's just bitcoin and fiat uh, there is going to be satoshi as well uh, we are not going for bits or at least i am not aware of that are you Joseph Stackerman on Twitter? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was looking through your profile and I saw that you like meat. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I noticed that a lot of uh, Bitcoiners are you know, very um, strong, aggressive advocates for meat. And I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not very really religious when it comes to my diet. So I wanted to ask, what what exactly is it that you know? I've seen similarities. Lots of Bitcoiners like Saif, you know, are very aggressive on their positions on eating meat, you know, meat, 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 meat. And so, <laughs> please explain it to me. You know, like I'm five. Explain it to me why. You know, explain this. You know, this stance to me. Uh, so um, uh, the book that changed my view on like what kind of diet I have is uh, Paul Saladino's Carnivore Code is uh, quite famous in this community, uh, like in the carnivore community. And yeah, uh, this is the term for the diet, carnivore, carnivorism, basically, where you eat uh, mostly meat. Uh, and it's not just steaks, it's organ meat as well, like liver and heart. Uh, and uh, you can eat some fruit uh, and such. And the idea behind it is uh, for millions of years, uh, humans and their predecessors basically thrived mostly on meat and uh, uh, the Neolithic revolution where we started to cultivate plants is just 10,000 years ago and we haven't adjusted to it as much. We are not herbivores like, uh, for example, gorillas or chimpanzees are. Uh, their digestive system is totally different to us. Uh, we can eat plants, we are basically omnivores, but uh, the optimal diet for humans is uh, animal-based, basically, animal-based fat and protein. And uh, Saladino goes into like both the evolutionary perspective and into like biological perspective. Uh, for me, uh, everything improved, basically, once I started to adopt uh, 
uh, animal-based diet, uh, my eczema disappeared, uh, my digestion is my, much better, uh, my you know brain fog or how to say it uh, lifted, my mood improved. So it's uh, it's um, pretty amazing actually what it can do to your body to have the proper diet. Yeah, and uh, but like uh, the main uh, problem for most people is uh, they eat uh, processed junk food. You should basically eliminate you know processed food, seed oils, uh, excessive sugar and such, and you are going to be pretty good off. Uh, then if you want to be even better off, uh, you can uh, adopt this uh, like animal-based diet. Yeah, I've found, because uh, I've done in the past, like I think it was like a month of being vegan, and then I did a month like a month later of being like mainly meat. It's like so, <laughs> literally both complete opposite. Cause I, cause I from a feel like moral standpoint, I'm, I'm not overly decided yet. And, and also I'm lactose intolerant anyway. So yeah, didn't really make much being vegan. Wasn't really, it was just like, stop eating meat. That was basically it really. Um, and so I tried both and it's funny how like both gave me like this oddly different sense of feeling healthier. I think, but I think as you, as you hit on though, it's like you, you stop eating a load of processed foods. You're paying more attention to what you're putting in your body. So immediately kind of doing anything like that is going to help. Um, but as you say, it's weird. Cause like, you know, being on this like vegan stuff thing, I felt healthier in ways, but kind of weirdly like unhealthy in other ways. And then being on the meat side, I, I felt healthy in another way. And like, it's very, like you get these two different ways. Sure. So um, I think it's quite interesting to, to pick these diets like that, but um I can see why you're uh, a passionate uh, believer in like eating like good uh, and good quantities of meat. I, just, I don't know how you eat awful like like liver and like heart and things like that, and I, I can't do it. I know it's meant to be really good for you, isn't it? Um, like a friend of mine eats. Yeah, yeah, it's totally uh, packed with nutrients, and they are very like bioavailable for your body. So yeah, uh, the taste you get used to it. Yeah, I think for me it's just getting around my head. I'm just like, I, can't, like, I struggle <laughs> to do it, but it's like kind of get. Get around that like in brazil they have colossal like chicken hearts so love it yeah yeah well uh definitely with uh, any like radical changes in diet you should do your own research it's the same as with bitcoin uh i don't want to like evangelize anybody into making some radical change in their life based on some podcast just uh read the book perhaps the carnivore code and there are other uh, good uh, resources for that and make your own choice Yes, very smart advice. DIYOR, do your own research uh, when it comes to most stuff in, in life. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I guess we've we've run for a, a good sort of 50 minutes or so, so it's probably a good time to close things off. Uh, Ricardo, Jerry, was there anything you had, like burning questions you wanted to ask at all before we before we do so, or are you good? Uh, I had one. What's the single most exciting um, development for Trezor that's coming in the next year or so? Uh, during the next year, I'm uh, looking forward to... Uh, Tropic Square, because uh, as a part of Satoshi Labs uh, family, we have uh, a new startup that's called Tropic Square, and it is developing, developing a secure element chip that is going to be completely open source, because uh, many hardware wallets use secure elements, which are closed source, and we are working on, or the Tropic Square is working on a secure element that would be open source, and uh, as I said, uh, it's aligned with our philosophy of being open and transparent and cutting no corners. So this is going to be pretty exciting once we see the prototype and then it uh, being used as part of a Trezor. So yeah, this is uh, what I'm excited about for the next year. Yeah, I agree. That is super exciting because that's one of the largest criticisms against Ledger and Cold Card is that they use a, um, a chip. Closed source. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, I like that. Uh, why well, I'm a fan of Trezor over the others, uh, myself, uh, things, ideas like that, and the open source nature. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess, uh, yeah, it's probably a good time to, yeah, call, call it the end, as we say. And uh, I appreciate you coming on, Joseph. It's been uh, awesome to chat to you and get some insight into your views and, and understanding of kind of, you know, a little bit of the background of, of Trezor and, and how, how they're running and what the plans are moving forward. and kind of what you've been up to so uh, it's been yeah fantastic to have you and uh, i really appreciate your time uh so it's awesome of you and uh thanks ricardo and jerry for joining us as well as as always uh, and also just to thank you to all the listeners essentially for listening in uh, we appreciate you um and if you've ever got any questions or anything just uh, drop us a, a message on twitter um but uh but otherwise uh have an awesome morning evening afternoon day week 
keep researching Bitcoin, keep learning and keep loving life. And uh, we will see you all soon. Bye, so meet. Thank you so much.